Okay, enough screen time. Oh, Dad, can you listen to the radio instead, please? I suppose so. They play some good tunes on... Not your boring grown-up station. It's not. Funk it, please. We can get that downstairs on the smart speaker, not in the bedroom. It's okay. We can get it on the app. If you say so. Okay. Thanks, Dad. Now, let me have your tablet. Screen time is over. About that, you just said we can listen on the app. And the app is on our tablet. It was downloaded from the App Store for free yesterday by Mum. But... You did promise. Listen anywhere. Smart kids listen on Smart Speaker. This is Fun Kids. Make this the best fall. And start at Plato's Closet in North Charleston and West Ashley. Earn cash for clothes. We're buying your trendy, gently used fall styles, like boots, hoodies, denim, jackets, and other fall pieces. If you have cool fall styles just sitting in your closet and you don't plan to wear them again, earn cash on the spot. Make this the best fall with cash for clothes. We want your sustainable fall styles at Plato's Closet. Stop by today. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. Hello and welcome to Bookworms, the podcast from Fun Kids, where we tell you all of the brilliant books that are out right now. My name is Bex and I love books, and we've got some great recommendations on the way for you. But first, it's a chat with A.M. Howell. Now, she's going to tell us all about her brand new one, Mysteries at Sea, Peril on the Atlantic. Now, Anne-Marie has provided all kinds of historic references to cruise ships in the 1930s, and it's a must-read if you're looking for an epic mystery to get stuck into. So I'm joined right now by the author A.M. Howell. Hello, how are you doing? Hello. Hi, Bex. How are you? I'm lovely to be here. How are you? Yeah, good. It's been a while since we spoke to you. It's been a little time, hasn't it? It certainly has. Yeah, quite a few years, I think. I think it has. But you've returned with a great new book. So uh, so it's all good. We've got Mysteries at Sea, Peril on the Atlantic. And uh, it's a real page turner, this one, isn't it? Oh, it is a little bit different to what I've written before, actually, I think, this one. Not set in Suffolk. The first one, not set in Suffolk. And yeah, a really big mystery with lots going on. It is, uh, a, I was going to say, on the, well, it is the ocean blue, basically. Uh, you've got the Queen Mary. Now, tell us a little bit about the ship, the Queen Mary. Yeah, so the Queen Mary is a real ship that used to sail between Southampton and New York. She was launched in the 1930s and she was a really glamorous ocean liner. Loads of celebrities of the day travelled on her, lots of movie stars. And it was a really sort of inventive ship in that there were all sorts of things on board, like dog kennels, you could take your dogs with you on board, your car even. And some people took so much luggage, you could take like over 100 pieces of luggage if you wanted to and they'd just store it on board the ship. So there was so much to learn about this amazing liner. Yeah, I did. When I was reading the book, there was a bit where there was a lamppost in it because uh, one of the kings thought a dog might be more at home with a lamppost. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. So the King of England, he loved his dogs and he travelled on board and he thought he wanted his dogs to be really comfortable in the dog kennels. And so he had a little lamppost in store. So when they went about their daily business, they felt at home. <laughs> I love that fact. Also, uh, am I right in the book, uh, Fred Astaire is on board as well? Yeah, so lots of celebrities travelled on board, as I said. And Fred Astaire, he really did travel on the Queen Mary. And he tap danced on the railings, can you believe? I'm not sure whether it was the railings overlooking the sea or whether it was a slightly safer location. I hope hope it was. Yes, but there was a little cameo from him in the book as well. There is. So, yeah, the Queen Mary uh, was a real ship. The whole point of it was it was a big, beautiful liner. And, of course, a lot of our listeners might have heard of the Titanic, which um, was a similar vibe, but uh, but, but many years before, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So the Titanic was uh, a few years before that. And there is actually a reference to it. So one of the stewardesses in my story knows a friend who worked on the Titanic and survived the sinking and she talks about this lady and it was a real lady actually uh, called Violet Jessup who lived in Suffolk and she actually rescued a baby from the Titanic and she ended up on the Carpathia which was the ship that actually came to save the passengers after they were all in the lifeboats and she had this little baby and she got on board the Carpathia and the mother of the baby came along and said oh there's my baby and didn't even say thank you just took the baby and walked off which I think is a really shocking story but a sign of the times maybe that is yeah that's an incredible story now so you've got the Queen Mary but more importantly I guess you've got Alice your main character tell us about her how does she end up on the ship so Alice ends up on the ship because her father uh, Captain Townsend he's the second in command on the Queen Mary so Alice is normally at boarding school as very sadly her mother passed away she lives with her aunt during the school holidays but her aunt's taken sick so she has to go on board the Queen Mary and she's always wanted to go to sea but her father's been very cagey about taking her on board the ships he works on and she can't understand why so she's thrilled with this opportunity so she's always wanted an adventure and when she gets on board her dad says sorry Alice you've got to stay in the cabin for the cruise I don't want you wandering the ship and of course a 12 year old girl is never going to do what their father says and so she's straight off on an adventure and going on a little tour of the ship and as she does 
she comes across a shocking attack on a cabin steward in the first class swimming pool. And she then decides that she has to solve the crime. So her voyage, her four-day voyage, is really turned upside down. She's got to sneak about the ship as she's not supposed to be out of the cabin and also solve this terrible crime. I mean, I have to say, when I read the book and the description of what else was on board the ship, like either it's a shopping area and a swimming pool and the promenade, I was like, of course she's going to have to go and check all that. Can you imagine your dad saying to you, no, you can't, all of these amazing things are above you and below you, but you can't go and see any of them. You must stay the cabin. Exactly, yes, of course. That was really fun to write, actually, about about, you know, Alice exploring the ship and trying to keep out of the way of her dad. And yeah, yeah. I mean, who would stay in the cabin? Nobody, I'm sure. Oh, not at all. And so, yeah, it, it becomes a bit of a mystery. And she makes a few friends along the way with people on board the ship as well, right? She does. So she meets a boy called Sonny, um, who's travelling on board with his governess, and a girl called Miriam, who is actually a Jewish girl. She's escaping the atrocities happening in Germany at the time. The Second World War hadn't started, but Jewish families were being very badly affected by the German Chancellor Hitler's new rules that were brought in. Um, So a lot of people were actually escaping to try and get work overseas and emigrate to America. And there's also a bellboy on board who they make friends with as well, Charlie. So there's a bit of a a quad thing going on there. They become really good friends and they try and solve the mystery together. Is it weird writing a mystery? Did you plan it very much in advance? Did you know the ending but not the beginning? Like, How does it work for you? Do you know what? This is the first book that I planned out really, really carefully. I think because I knew it was going to be a series, I really wanted to be very clear on the characters and how the series was going to play out. So I did a really detailed scene plan for this book and then agreed it with my publisher. So I found when I was starting, I felt really confident that I knew where I was going. But having said that, when I started writing, I started veering off in all these really different directions, introducing new characters. But I thought, I think that's just what writing's about, really, sort of finding your way and having a bit of fun during the process. Yeah, I bet. Was there a character in particular that you enjoyed writing? I really enjoyed writing uh, this character called the Baroness, who is travelling on board the Queen Mary with her twittering canaries in cages. And this is based on a real character who did used to sort of travel on ocean liners with her sort of lots and lots of canaries in cages. And um, she reveals something to Alice that makes her question her own past because there were two sort of parallel stories going on. Alice discovers that her father is up to some mysterious things by visiting the ship's hold. And there's a story around a silk glove that belonged to her mother. And she starts to sort of find out things about her past that are quite curious and secretive while solving the mystery of who attacked the cabin steward as well. So the Baroness is kind of a pivotal moment, really. It was a really atmospheric scene to write as she meets Alice on board on a really foggy day. So the ship is steaming through the fog. Its whistle is sounding to alert other ships that they're in the sea. And then the Baroness reveals something very secretive. There's a bit of a turning point in the story. Oh, what a tease. I love it. I love it so much. Did you have to do lots of research then for this book? I did. I really did. So um, I traveled a lot on ships when I was young for my dad's job. Um, He used to to do sabbaticals abroad and he'd always loved to travel by sea. He was pretty obsessed by the sea and ships. He would do paintings of them and read lots of books about them. So we had lots of books in my parents' house all about ships. So I raided their sort of ship library initially and did a lot of reading up and learned a lot about the Queen Mary. Um, And also then my dad, he also gave me a DVD of the Queen Mary sort of real footage of the ship when it was sailing, which was really, really helpful. And then I dug deep into sort of newspaper archives and read lots of reports on what it was like to travel on her. So the research was a really, really fun element of this book, I think. Oh, I bet. I mean, even reading the book made me want to go and go on a cruise, basically, or go into the <laughs> Queen Mary. Um, and you said it's a series, right? It is, yeah. So the second book in the series is called The Royal Jewel Plot. And that's coming out uh, next April. And Alice is back to solve another mystery, this time cruising the beautiful Mediterranean in the hot summer, along with the King of England and Mrs. Wallace Simpson. And it's based on a real voyage that King Edward and Wallace did take in 1936. That was the summer before he abdicated from the throne and passed the throne to his brother. And it's kind of leading up to that, really. And there's an octopus on board, a very poisonous octopus and an opal. And when both go missing... Alice has got a big mystery to solve. Oh, I love it so much. Alice is becoming quite the detective. This is amazing. She is. Uh, So the book is out right now and everybody can grab it wherever they they get books, basically. Mysteries at Sea, Peril at the Atlantic. Uh, Thank you so much for telling us all about it. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on today. There we go. A big old one from A.M. Howell there. Uh, Next up, we've got Hannah Gold and Finding Bear. Now, this is the sequel to The Last Bear, a story about a girl and her friendship with a polar bear. I recently met Hannah Gold, actually, and she told me a little little bit of behind-the-scenes goss about the newest book in the series, and it looks like it's going to be absolutely epic. So here's a special voice note, especially for us, to find out more. Hi, my name is Hannah Gold, and I am the author 
of The Last Bear and The Lost Whale. And I'm here to tell you about something very exciting, and that's my new book, Finding Bear. Finding Bear is a sequel to The Last Bear because in all the school visits I used to do, the one question that I got asked the most was, will April and Bear ever see each other again? And the answer is yes. In Finding Bear, we pick up the action about 17 months after the last bear is finished. April returns to Svalbard because she hears that a polar bear has been shot and she fears it may be her best friend. And when she's there, she travels across Arctic tundra, across icy glaciers, across frozen rivers to try to find her best friend. And along the way, she discovers something else. A teeny, tiny polar bear cub. Yes, bear has had a cub. I can't wait to share this new book with you. It was such a joy to return to April and Bear's story, to capture the full force of an Arctic storm, to write my favourite scene, which is when they reunite, and also to introduce this brand new character of the tiny polar bear cub that you're hopefully going to read all about. I really love this book and I'm so, so excited to share it with you. It's full of the most glorious illustrations by Levi Pinfold and I really think it's a book that you're going to love. Oh my goodness, if you love the Rebel Girl series, you're going to love Dear Rebel. This is from Tara Kangalu and Freya Lewis, and it's a book filled with advice from 145 inspirational women. Now, two of its authors are award-winning global affairs journalists, uh, Tara and Freya, I just mentioned, and they are absolutely brilliant. They're here to talk about their own contributions to this amazing book. Hi, Rebel Girls. It's so good to be with you all. And I'm super excited to be reading you a small story I wrote about my childhood. Dear Rebel Girls, when I was around your age, I was still living in my country of birth, Iran, in its extraordinary, colorful, super busy capital of Tehran, a place I will forever call my first and most beloved home. You know, despite the many challenges in Iran at the time, which have continued and evolved to this day, I would watch some of the same cartoons as you, play with some of the same toys as you, including Barbie dolls, and read some of the books that you and so many other rebel girls like you enjoy reading. Just like you, I took joy in playing make-believe, writing secrets in my journal, and finding my BFFs in school many of whom I'm actually lucky enough to call best friends, even after 30 years and many moves around the world. Just like you, I had silly fears, bold ideas, and confusing thoughts. But most importantly, just like you and millions of other rebel girls in Iran and around the world, I loved to dream. I loved to find inspiration in every corner, even in the unknown Right when I was about to start high school, though, my family decided to partially migrate to the United States for a better future, one where hard work, commitment, and confidence can can help you reach any goals and dreams that you may have, one where I would never be held back by the government's bullying and neglect toward its citizens. However, I didn't like my life in California and found every excuse to go back to Tehran, to spend time with my friends, to ride my bicycle on the streets where I once played with my cousins, and to take comfort in the reality that I belonged, that I belonged. You know, never in my life had I felt sadder than those early years in a place I was supposed to call my new home. You see, it wasn't the location that bothered me, but the ever-present reminder that I did not belong. You see, I had accepted myself and was proud of who I was, my story, my country of origin, and all that I had to offer to my new community, but others were not. In fact, they knew nothing about me and spent more time questioning my many differences instead of trying to understand the beauty in our two very unique backgrounds. 
every day, in every encounter, and in every conversation, I found myself having to explain my identity, who I was, where I came from, why I spoke with an accent, why my last name is so difficult to spell. Is it kangaroo with the ears and a cute baby? And ultimately, why was I so different, at least to them? My classmates often made fun of me for mispronouncing something or not knowing a slang word or an American joke. I'd never forget my first week in ninth grade when I asked a friend what she was having for lunch. I thought food would be the easiest and most universal icebreaker, but I was immediately mocked. You see, it was the first time I heard the word sub. And when I asked her, what is sub? She looked at me as if I was from another planet. From then on, I asked my mom to never pack me anything but subs. <laughs> Three months into my ninth grade experience in the US, I returned to Tehran. But after two years back in Iran, I decided that I wasn't going to let someone else's ignorance hurt me. I wasn't going to let go of my roots just to belong. I could have let the belittling, mocking, and confusion of others define my identity. You see, I could have easily lost sight of my own self. But instead, I chose to channel my sadness and frustration into determination. I wanted to take every opportunity to correct the misconceptions about me. I hope you own your differences. Remember that if you speak with an accent, it means you know more than one language. If your lunch looks different from someone else's, that means you have a new taste to offer. Most importantly, if people don't know about your country of birth, city of origin, or community, you have the opportunity to be an ambassador of your culture and all the beauty that makes it all so special. You see, when I was a young immigrant, I tried to find common ground in food, music, books, and movies, and soon learned that similarities were everywhere. Yes, they were everywhere. We just have to have an open heart, an open mind, and an open eye to see it all, to feel it all. Now, let's promise each other that instead of focusing on finding differences in others, we'll try to focus on what we have in common. Let's promise each other that we'll always take pride in the knowledge that the differences we bring to the table only make the table more colorful, vibrant, and rich. And lastly, let's promise to never let our differences limit us and never let anyone's interpretation of you define your identity, your roots, and who you can be. I also want to leave you with a special recipe for a sandwich or a small sub that I used to love as my morning snack back when I was your age in Tehran. Just in case you need an inspiration for your next snack or lunch, or if you want to share a special story with your friends at school about a rebel girl from Iran. In Farsi, we call this Noon Panir Sabzi, which literally translates to bread, cheese, and herbs. The ingredients are bread. Now, it can be any kind of bread you have in the kitchen, but my favorite and most traditional is lavash bread or any sort of pita-style bread that you can roll. Then you have some feta cheese, Persian cucumber slices, fresh herbs including cilantro, tarragon, basil, garden cress, red radishes, and green onions. And of course, my favorite, walnuts. Now, just place all the fillings on the bread and roll it into a thin roll. And there you go. And as we say in Farsi, Nusha Jan, enjoy. Hello, my name is Fray Lewis and I'm a contributor to the incredible book Dear Rebel by Rebel Girls. This book aims to inspire young women everywhere and features over 125 different stories from inspirational women all over the world. I'm now going to read to you a bit from my piece that I called Keep Hold of Those Dreams. Ever since I was young, people told me that it was important to have dreams, that it was vital to think about what incredible goals I could achieve when I grew up. Over and over, my wonderful mum has always told me, always keep hold of those dreams, Freya. I've been a daydreamer my whole life. In school, I used to spend way too much time thinking about what could happen in the future. 
My main dream when I was a young girl was to become an actor. From the moment I stepped on the old wooden stage during my year six play, I felt in my bones that I was meant to be a performer. I joined a weekly acting class when I was 12 and I found myself longing for each weekend to come when I would have the freedom to explore hundreds of characters. I could forget about whatever happened during the week and escape into a new universe as soon as I stepped into the room. However, as I grew up and I went to high school, things began to change. I realised that all my friends in year seven were focused on completely different dreams. They even told me that becoming an actor was not a realistic goal. Some of my teachers did too. I enjoyed school. I loved learning and I have always known the importance of education. Although I still loved acting more than anything, the world started altering my mindset. I thought that becoming an actor wasn't achievable for a girl like me and it would be more sensible to think about a more normal career. That's a little snippet from my piece in Dear Rebel. Unfortunately, when I was 14 years old, me and my best friend attended an Ariana Grande concert at Manchester Arena and an evil person carried out a violent attack and my best friend sadly passed away. I was left with multiple injuries and I had to alter the way that I looked at life. In the piece, I talk about how we should always chase our dreams no matter what happens. And I want to thank Rebel Girls for giving me this absolutely incredible opportunity to be able to put that out there. My piece includes advice that I would have loved to have had as a young girl. And it's an absolute honour. That sounds amazing. I love Dear Rebel books so, so much. Now, I also want to know what books you've been loving recently, and I got this through from Joshua. Hey, Joshua, what are you reading? Horrid Henry. Horrid Henry, yes, my old pal Horrid Henry. I love that series. He's the character who says what he's thinking and does what he likes. And who wants to be a perfect Peter anyway? Definitely not me. Uh, Right, if you do want to send in a little message to us, just download the Fun Kids app and tell me what book you've been reading on there. I would love to know what you're up to at the moment. And that is pretty much it for today's episode of the Bookworms podcast. I'll be back super soon with some more recommendations for you. But in the meantime, remember to like, subscribe and follow wherever it is you get your pods from. Bye. We're home. Adam's dad just dropped us off. What did you get up to? We've been playing and listening to fun kids. On the radio? Actually, it was on a smart speaker. Yeah, we just shouted Alexa, play fun kids. And it started playing songs we liked, not like your grown-up station. Oh, well, we probably can't do that as we don't have Alexa, we have Google. Hey Google, play fun kids. How did you know how to do that? George, from The Breakfast Show, told us how it works on smart speakers. I should have known. He's very smart. Get Fun Kids on your smart speaker all around the house. Just tell it to play Fun Kids. Grab your BFFs and get stuck into Girl Talk magazine. Full of your fave celebs and YouTubers. Each issue is packed with fun, including puzzles and cute pets, quizzes and amazing bakes. All this plus awesome prizes, fab fashion and amazing gifts. Girl Talk magazine. Get it every month. What are you waiting for?